Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. Um, Going to get started with flow engineering and hopefully show you folks a bunch of stuff that maybe you haven't seen before and you can take away to your jobs uh, and really pick up a new valuable skill and perspective that's going to help you not only in your current role, but as you communicate with other roles, as you make decisions, as you craft your strategy for 2021 and try and add the most value possible in your role and in your teams and organizations. So I wanna start by thinking a little bit about decisions and direction. I like to talk a lot about compasses and maps because I feel like using those two kind of archetypes, we can combine them in order to navigate our own strategies, decisions, challenges, and opportunities uh, where one of the two would be much less valuable but than the combination. And what do I mean by that? So uh, for instance, a compass tells us where to head in a specific direction, right? It's gonna tell us where we're going off track, where we're able to course correct to head to a true north or a direction that we think is valuable. But what we really need to do to make a compass valuable is to combine it with a map, right? We need this ability to see our surroundings so that the compass doesn't lead us off a cliff or lead us to a dead end. So the contrast to that, if we're thinking of the opposite of just having a map, if we have a map, we really don't know where we're going. You know, we could pick an arbitrary spot on the map, uh, head in a specific direction for a period of time. And if we're not able to see milestones, if we're not able to judge our direction at any given time, we could run in circles. Uh, it could take us much longer to get where we're going than if we really had the combination of a compass and map. And these days, you know, we are well beyond compasses and maps. We have GPS, we have step-by-step, turn-by-turn um, directions for all of our navigation. But we don't have that when we're developing software, when we're working in IT environments, when we're strategizing and, and trying to make really complex decisions about the direction that we need to go and where we need to invest. And that's where I spend all of my time. I focus all my energy on how do we make extremely high quality decisions that improve the flow of value through our organizations. And it starts with this idea of direction. Where are we aiming? Where should we be setting our sights? And then we follow that with this idea of how are we doing, right? Like what is our current state? How are we performing currently? Because if we want to improve, we have to have a baseline in order to notice any difference from anything that we do, right? If we have this ability of seeing where we're starting from, then we know when we're making progress. We know when something's not working and we know when we need to adjust, right? This is the map to a certain degree. This is surveying the landscape and seeing, okay, do I see any milestones here? Do I see any landmarks? that will help me navigate. And then what we also want to know is by combining these things together, what are we missing? What are the pieces that aren't on the map right now? Or, you know, if we get to a certain point on the landscape, what do we do then, right? What are the things that we might not have accounted for? Maybe the landscape has shifted over time, right? Maybe there was a landslide and now the path that we thought we could take is no longer available. And that might sound uh, familiar in 2020 because the landscape has shifted, right? Things have changed. So we need to be able to look at what's going on and make new decisions and new strategies to try and navigate all of the challenges that we now have. So this idea of having compasses and maps and then uh, combining that with a view of performance is going to allow us to make extremely high quality decisions that improve the flow of value through our organizations. And that's what flow engineering is all about. And I'm going to get into what it looks like, how you do it, um, and how you can make this really work for you 
on Monday when you go back to work. So a lot of the things that are challenging in 2020 have been challenging for a very long time. Uh, and the interesting thing about them is that they're getting more and more challenging. They're getting more and more common. The scale is increasing. Things are getting more complex all the time. We're seeing more friction as we try to scale up the complexity of our efforts and the scale of our efforts and tackle new challenges and layer on new innovations to what we're doing. And all of that is adding waste at the same time because we can't do this perfectly efficiently, right? We have to scale things. And what happens when we scale is that we miss details, things fall through the cracks, things get neglected. And so what are the tools and capabilities that we have available to step back from our everyday and look at where we can drive investment to make serious improvements, to make innovative improvements, to revolutionize what we're doing under new circumstances and go back to the drawing board, shift gears or shift our direction to adjust to the current landscape. And that landscape could be self-defined. It could be, we got to where we're, we wanted to go and now we're picking a new destination. Or it could be forced on you, like COVID-19 forced a bunch of new directions on people. Um, you know, it threw up a bunch of barriers on the landscape that caused people to redirect their efforts or steer in a new direction. Um, and whether you want to think of that as landslides, avalanches, uh, rainstorms, uh, there's all kinds of ways that you could parallel this to physical landscape. Um, and I like that analogy because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly easy for people to put that into their minds and think, okay, what is the, what is the compass that I have right now? Is it getting to 10 minute deploys or is it, um, doubling the frequency at which we can deliver software or is it, uh, cutting our mean time to recovery down by half? Um, or maybe it's adding 20 people to your division. These are all compasses. The map is how do you actually do that? How are you actually going to get from where you are right now to where you want to go? And if we look at all the tools available for doing that, there's really not a lot. And I'm going to share my favorite and what you can actually use um, as soon as you leave this talk to start to build this picture for yourself and then share it with other people. So why should you listen to me about this? Uh, I've been in the game for 21 years in the tech game, but specifically focused on flow. I've spent my entire uh, career focused on improving the flow of work and value through organizations. And that started in tech support. So how do I finish all, all of my tech support calls as quickly as possible and get to solutions as quickly as possible? How do I handle twice as many calls in a day? How do I eliminate 60, 70% of the calls that are coming into the call center to build and release engineering? How do we get to faster deploys? How do I cut a release from five days down to five hours? Um, looking at teams doing data ingestion, how do we ingest a hundred times more data in a tenth of the time? These are all problems that I've been obsessed with through my whole career, and I've used the same techniques to tackle each and every one of them. And that's what I'm going to share with you folks today. And the other good news about this is that it works in any size organization. So I've used this in tiny, tiny startups. Uh, I've used this personally in my own life. I've used it with my own teams. I've used it in gigantic enterprises and it works the same way every single time. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Hopefully we don't get any other pop-ups. So what is in this for you? So this is, um, I like this acronym, WIIFM. Um, what you're going to get out of this talk and this technique is this ability to align different people's perspectives. One thing that's really common in organizations, I, I would say, you know, it's almost a law at this point. And if you wanted to say Pereira's law, 
it's probably that if you ask eight different people where the biggest bottleneck in their organization is, you're going to get eight different answers. You're always going to get different answers about what is the biggest, most important thing that we should focus on. So how do we change that from eight answers to one answer? How do we bring everybody's perspective into alignment so that everyone is pulling in the same direction? Everyone has the same idea of where we're going. And they might have different parts to play, but having everyone set to the same north is incredibly important, right? Otherwise, things get a lot more complicated. In 2020, with so many people remote and so many people operating at a higher level of autonomy and self-direction and disconnection from the rest of their teams, where you can't just tap someone on the shoulder or sit next to them and see what they're seeing, um, we need this ability to share the same view, to share the same vision. And we need to do it quickly and effectively. And what that means is that it, it needs to be visual. You know, we're visual creatures. Uh, we have a massive portion of our brain assigned to visual understanding and cognition. So we need these pictures that make sense to all of us, regardless of our role, if we're a developer or we're the CEO or we're the head of marketing. We need pictures that we can all understand very quickly and get on the same page. And we need to use these pictures to discover opportunities, right? We need to, this ability to map and find the easiest path through all of our challenges. And that gives us the ability to target where we're investing. It gives us the ability to put our time and energy and money in the places where it's going to pay off. Right. It doesn't make sense for us to invest three months in automating something that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. And I see that in teams all the time. They're constantly investing in areas that are based on a hypothesis. And I, I will say a hypothesis, but that's being generous. It's someone's gut feeling or, you know, they read an article that, oh, we need to start using Kubernetes because everyone's using Kubernetes. But what value is that providing to your organization or your company uh, and your customers, right? How is that going to pay off? What part of the value delivery process is Kubernetes addressing for you? And if you can answer those questions, you have a very high probability of success with your investment. But if you can't, if you haven't thought of what is the value of this, what pain point is it actually solving? then you're really going to have a challenge on your hands when it comes to explaining uh, you know, why that three months that was supposed to be three weeks is not a total waste of time. Because we all know that scope expands, things get more challenging um, when we start really looking at them and working on them. So if we can base all of our investment and, and all of our efforts on value and something that we've quantified and measured so that we can demonstrate that to people who don't really understand what we're doing or don't necessarily see the value. We have to be able to share that easily and say, we're doing this, we're making this investment, we're doing this effort to address this major bottleneck that we expect to pay off and save us three weeks every quarter, or it's going to drive quality up by 60% or, you know, we're going to enhance our delivered value by 30%. These are the statements that you can make when you start using flow engineering to quantify the flow of value through the organization and you use value stream mapping to put all that together. And those measurements, that quantification allows you to solve these problems and do it in a way that it resonates with everybody else in the organization, because you're no longer arguing, you're no longer discussing these things um, in conversation or in a document, you're able to point to measurement and say, this is, can you agree, you know, that three minutes is less than 30 minutes or three weeks. And everyone can agree on data more than they can agree on different perspectives, right? We all have different perspectives. We all have different um, opinions on things, 
So we can use data to reconcile those different opinions and make the choices collectively that are based on data. So what does flow really look like? What am I talking about when I talk about flow and the value stream? And I'll get to the value stream in a moment, but this concept of flow really is this path through time that we are creating and delivering value to our customers. And our customers can be internal, external, they can be um, partners, they can be colleagues in our organization. It really doesn't matter who you consider a customer. What matters is that the value that we're creating and delivering flows without an excessive amount of friction and complexity and waste, right? Those three things that I highlighted earlier in the talk. So we wanna be able to see this, right? We wanna be able to visualize it and measure it so that we can find out where it's breaking down or where there are opportunities for improvement. It could be in the build phase, it could be in validation, it could be our release is, is too complex or, or you know, it often fails or we're not delivering enough value for our efforts. It takes forever. And all we really have to do is this one simple thing, but because of all the approvals that we need to do or the meetings that we have to do, we're not seeing that value. So these are the sort of things that we can see once we visualize and measure. What often happens in, even in 2020, we have this focus on automation, right? Everyone says automate all the things. And so many organizations are focused on automation efforts, but what they tend to forget is that what we really need to do is automate where it matters, right? We only wanna automate things that first are delivering value, right? Automating things that aren't delivering value is just a recipe for a bad time. We can definitely automate our way to a bunch of errors and, and uh, you know, cause a lot of problems by automating the wrong things or automating things incorrectly. So before we start automating, what we want to do is make sure that we're automating the highest priority area of the value stream that we can. And that means that we have to identify the biggest bottleneck, the, the place where everything slows down or every, all the quality falls apart or you know, we're, not we're not creating any value. If we can look at the whole picture, which is how I'm drawing these boundaries here is from the moment that we start costing the company money, like we start working on something, right? That could be the idea stage. That could be you know, the moment someone sits down at a blank page and starts sketching out an idea. Once someone starts paying for something internally, the clock starts and it doesn't stop on the value stream until you start making money from the outcome. And that big picture, that's a huge stretch, right? That's the, that's the whole thing. That matters because the bottleneck is usually somewhere in there. It's not usually where we're, we're focused on software development or software delivery. It also matters because as technical folks, people focused on automation. For us to really be effective and communicate the value that we provide, the resources that we need to provide that value, the investment, the, the areas of technical debt that we need to tackle, we need to have these conversations with people all the way through this process, right? Upstream in the business, we need to be able to have conversations with people in sales and marketing and, and project management and make good arguments about, yeah, I need more people to do this, or I need this specific skill set in order to tackle this problem, because this is where we're having the most challenges, right? This is the bottleneck. And the more you can bring those people into to your perspective and share that big picture view, the more likely you're going to have success in getting what you want. And that could be a promotion, it could be funding, it could be more staff, it could be a software package. There's any number of things that you need to battle for and really you know, sell to your organization in order to improve things. 
And you want to make sure that you're making the best argument that you can, right? And you're making the best decision that you can. How do you know that you're investing in the right place? How do you know that it's in the company's best interest to adopt a specific solution or software package? If you can see that entire value stream, the whole picture, and you're focused on the true bottleneck, then all of a sudden, you know, that's a highly powerful, uh, motivating uh, ability that you have, and you'll be respected for it, right? If you can bring this picture to the organization and say, I've done the measurement, we've done the mapping, this is the bottleneck, it's going to take this investment, but here's what the payoff's going to be. You're a superhero, right? It, it's the most effective way of getting what you want is by getting people on your side and making a very convincing case for whatever outcome you're looking for. So I'll show you how that comes together. This is a closer view to where I spend a lot of my time. This is, a, this is an abstract depiction of two levels of a value stream map. And don't worry so much about the details here. What I wanna show you is that value streams and value stream mapping and this idea of flow engineering works at multiple levels in an organization. So an organization is made up of value streams. There's one for hiring employees, for onboarding new customers, for um, running an event, for uh, making coffee. All these things are value streams. Some are more important than others. If we think of you know, making ketchup, for instance, the most important value stream is how do we get tomatoes on one side and then someone buying ketchup on the other side. That's the big high level value stream. But within that, we have printing the labels for the bottles. Uh, we have the assembly line where we put the ketchup in the bottles. Like all these things are lower level value streams and they all kind of interact with each other. And same thing with software. In the software world, we commonly have a release, which is a large effort that combines maybe multiple teams, multiple products, working together, coming together to synchronize their efforts, and then delivering something fairly cohesive to our customers. And then we have these lower level value streams where we're iterating. You know, we go through a sprint process. We're going through a, a single pass of a Kanban workflow or you know, a, we're doing, let's say, incident response. And our incident response process would be like this lower level process. Um, these connect to each other. And you can see here at the high level, the release process, we've identified a specific area with a bottleneck. And that is this highlighted area in pink. We're able to look at the release process and then dive in deeper where we see a bottleneck and then pick that apart and we can expand that and see where's the bottleneck at the lower level. This allows us to dig deeper where we see more opportunity for detail and figuring something out, right? It's almost like asking five whys or doing investigation, you dig. You dig where you think there's value, right? You dig where you think there's an opportunity for an insight. And by digging down, we're able to see that at this lower level with the sprint, we have this one wait time that's standing out. And I'll show you, this is not measurements at this stage, but I'll show you what this looks like with measurements. But by measuring the wait time, we're able to highlight this opportunity. And so what might happen is at the team level, they care about the sprint, they care about this one wait time, they're gonna work to fix it. At the leadership level, maybe the COO or the CIO cares about the release and they can see the bottleneck from their perspective. They don't necessarily care about the low level. They just want to know, oh, yeah, we found the problem. It's over here. We're digging down with the team to solve it. But here's how it's affecting the stream level that you care about, the perspective that you care about. So we have this ability to zoom out and zoom in. And it's really powerful because it means that People get what they care about, right? They get to see the level of detail that they care about. And here's another view of that. So if we're looking at a release stream and how I mentioned that multiple products can come together in a release, 
all these streams are interacting with each other in different ways. And we can often d d discover a bottleneck because it's connected to this other stream that's dependent, right? Or that we depend on uh, that's holding things up. That could be because of an SLA. It could be because, you know, there's too much work. In this case, we have this mobile app, right? Mobile app A. It depends on a web app that's probably providing its back end. It also depends on a second web app that's providing its back end. Uh, maybe another capability or function. Maybe one is a login and the other one is providing some kind of event driven architecture. And then we have a platform stream and it's depending on all these things. There could be a bottleneck actually in one of those other streams that's affecting the mobile app stream and all of that is affecting the release. And so our ability to pick these apart and focus in different areas, maybe we start with the release stream and then we say, okay, well, there's a major bottleneck in the release process for mobile app A. It takes forever to get any change out to customers. So why is that? Well, okay, we can dig into mobile app A. Okay, what do we see? Maybe the bottleneck is related to uh, artifact deployment or infrastructure. Maybe we can't spin up a test environment in less than four days. So maybe we look at the platform stream and we can go and dig into the platform stream and look at that stream and find the bottleneck there. Maybe it's because you know we haven't automated uh, infrastructure creation or environment creation. So maybe we need to invest there. And then you see it, you know, that that improvement will bubble up and now it affects all these other things that could be affecting not only the mobile app, but the web apps as well. So by finding the real bottleneck, you can make improvements that affect the entire organization in some cases. And it's because of these dependencies, because these streams all interact with each other and the bottleneck could be hidden at in different locations. And the bottleneck's gonna change, right? Once we fix that bottleneck, there's a new bottleneck. But this is the practice of improvement. This is how we get to improvement. So in DevOps and in the organizations that are now focused on continuous improvement and continuous delivery and deployment, all this technical focus, we're not looking at the big picture, right? Most of the time, what we're looking at is the CI CD pipeline, the pieces that are already automated, which is a problem because they're already automated. They're already delivering highly efficient and effective outcomes. And they might not be really, they, you know, they could be breaking all the time. But more often than not, your problem is the manual stuff that you're doing, the stuff that's outside the pipeline the meetings that you're running, the delays between environments, the fact that you have all these dependencies on different uh, teams and, and components and external services. And so we need this ability to zoom out and see the big picture, the whole thing, especially because if we think of Dora metrics and the four key metrics of DevOps, these super important metrics that we're tracking for highly successful, highly performant organizations, lead time, change fail percentage, mean time to recover, they all span the value stream. They all span beyond the boundaries of the CI CD pipeline. So if we want to be truly measuring the most important things that we can in the DevOps world, in the highly performant software delivery organizations of the world, they're looking at the value stream. They're looking at the entire big picture end to end. So now onto specifics, I promised I'd get there. We're there. So here's what a value stream map that I create with my clients looks like. It's highly simplified. I recommend, you know, if you want a laugh um, or you want to cringe, go look at value stream mapping in Wikipedia. The value stream maps that we used to make uh, in legacy manufacturing, we've been doing this since the 70s or the 60s, I think. Very long time. The maps we used to make highly complicated and they wouldn't make sense to anyone without some training. And so I throw all that away. What I focus on here is the most important components. The most important components are the steps in the process, right? From start to finish, what are these specific activities that are happening? And so you can look at your own team, whether you're in software delivery or incident response, what are the steps that happen? And it doesn't matter really how you draw the boundaries there. Like, 
you could say that, you know, a step is very specific or, you know, it's a broad collection of things that happen it really doesn't matter, right? Whatever's giving you value. A good way to look at this is separate activities are when work gets handed from one role to another role. And that could be across teams. It could be from one individual to another individual. It could even go from developer to developer. If there's a handoff, it's a good idea to draw a boundary and say, these are two separate things that happen because what you want to measure is that delay between those two activities. So we're measuring both the timing of each of these activities, the delay between these activities, and the combination of that is going to give us this measurement of lead time, the entire time that it takes from start to finish. And we, we gain this ability to identify these hotspots. This area here stands out as exceptionally large amount of time, right? Relative to the rest of this value stream, we have hours, 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 a few days, but two weeks is a huge difference between all those other measurements and this one area of, of the value stream. So now we have a hotspot. Now we have a place to focus. It could be a bottleneck. It could be a real opportunity for improvement. Maybe not. Maybe there's no way to uh, avoid it could be that we can't avoid it because we're working with an external vendor and we have to send something to them. Maybe we're sending translations off to them to get translated and sent back and they have an SLA that's two weeks. But, you know, if this is our biggest bottleneck. Maybe this is an opportunity to go look at that and say, okay, maybe we, maybe we start doing that in-house. Maybe we start looking at a different vendor. We would never make that decision unless we were able to see that that is actually really holding us back. And it really is. If you compare two weeks to four days, it's a huge difference, right? So all of a sudden, what happens? Everyone can agree that this is the hotspot. And maybe, you know, after this, we focus on the four days. Maybe that's, maybe that's a good candidate. The reason I didn't highlight four days here is because sometimes we have value added activities that take a long time, but they're really valuable, right? So maybe they don't deserve a highlight. Maybe they're not a hotspot. Maybe we really wouldn't get better outcomes by trying to make them faster. Um, so they might not be a candidate just because they take long. And that's where we can add, we can add detail about quality, about value, but what I want to focus on here is the basics because you get tons of value from the basics. And if I'm leaving you with anything after this presentation, I want you to be able to build these maps yourself and share them with your team. And so I focus on just the core here. Once you're past that, we can look at all kinds of stuff, but um, this is really where you get a ton of value. So I'll show you a real case. This is from a client a while ago and they had a lot of money to spend on release cadence velocity. So the ability to release changes, they wanted to speed up their release process. It was very long. It was years actually, because they were they had hardware devices and they had all these industry approvals that they had to go through. It was very complex, but they wanted to look at this release process and they were targeting the idea of having automated deployment, which is great, right? Automated deployment is fantastic but only if you need it, only if it's your biggest bottleneck. And what we looked at, um, when, when we actually mapped the value stream, we discovered that there's two opportunities that had nothing to do with automated deployment. I mean, environment updates may be slightly related, but we had this candidate in environment updates. So what does it take to refresh the environment, maybe inject some data, maybe smoke test it and get it ready for an artifact? That was taking 11 hours. On the other end, acceptance testing was taking 116 hours. And maybe that's as long as it takes. Maybe it's gotta be 116 hours, who knows? But by visualizing this, what did we do? We saved a ton of time and a ton of money focusing on real bottlenecks and not on areas that aren't gonna make a difference. So if we can pair these things to artifact deployment, which might have been at the, you know, at the time when they were doing it, I believe what they would do is they would send a message through 
Slack, I believe they were using a bot and then the bot would trigger deployment. So they didn't have fully automated deployment, but they were at like 90% automation. So how much benefit are you going to get by taking this from an hour and five minutes down to what's the best you could do? 30 seconds. That would have such little impact on the overall lead time, the performance of this process compared to investing in the environment update and the accepted testing te um, steps. So we saved a lot of time, a lot of effort changing or influencing an area that wasn't really going to make a big difference by visualizing the real bottlenecks. And we were able to bring this to leadership and show them because even if you've never even heard of the company and you look at this, even if you've never heard of software development and you look at this, if you know basic math, you could say, yeah, 11 hours is more than an hour and 116 hours is more than 11 hours. Job done, right? How much technical documentation would you have to go through to arrive at the same conclusion? How much discussion would you have to go through to arrive at the same conclusion? But the map, visualizing the value stream you get there immediately. And I think that's incredibly powerful. And it's really not that hard to put this picture together. So what this looks like in 2020, is used to be me in a conference room with a bunch of whiteboards. Uh, sometimes there's paper all over the wall and we're drawing it out. Now it's entirely remotely. And I use Mural for this. You can use any collaborative whiteboard solution. I've used Google Drawings for it. I've used Keynote for it before. Uh, Mural is fantastic because you can do things like vote and everybody can contribute. Everybody can be adding notes and putting this picture together. And what happens is it's now a team building exercise. People are co-creating the value stream map. We're all working on flow engineering. We're all looking for bottlenecks and opportunities. Instead of just me guiding the entire process and running the show, I'm facilitating and the team learns how to do this. And I think that's incredibly powerful because they leave the exercise, not only with this new appreciation for what the big picture looks like and where the real bottlenecks are, but they leave with a skill. They can now map these things on their own and they're closer to their team, right? They've worked with, they've worked through this challenge as a team, as a collective, often with people that they don't work with on a regular basis. You know, and a lot of these exercises we have marketing and salespeople, and now they appreciate each other, right? The developers understand what the salespeople have to deal with and the marketing people understand what the success people have to deal with. And it brings everybody under the same perspective. And, and that's incredibly powerful. What happens really after doing one of these exercises so that this big map is a couple days, a couple different sessions, but if you just do the current state map for a single value stream, what happens is you identify a bottleneck that's worth at least 20% of the time, which means that it pays for itself usually times 10. It means saving a day a week. And that is, you know, where else are you going to get that return on investment for a few hours? Um, so this is incredibly powerful and it's incredibly powerful because teams aren't doing it right now. If we were doing it all the time, you wouldn't get 20%. You know, after a while, there's diminishing returns and you would, you know, you're you're optimizing and the the level of improvement lowers down over time. But going from not doing it to doing it, you see these gigantic improvements that they just pop out at you. And they're usually things that you can tackle really easily, like a meeting that you don't really need to do because you can just send a message on Slack or something. These are the things that pop out. And all of a sudden you can make a case for that meeting that everyone hates. You can get rid of it because you can show this is taking up, you know, a big portion of the value stream. So we go from the current state where you get that 20% better right away to an ideal state. And that's the creative aspect of it. That's where we get to innovation. We get to this idea. If we were rethinking everything from scratch, what would it look like? If we were trying to make this a hundred times better, what would it look like? And the ideal state really gets people thinking. It gets people energized. It gets people um, exercising their creative muscles. And 
it gives them the opportunity to really share their ideas and, you know, things that they've been thinking about or things that they've seen in other companies or um, things that they've seen in other industries that might work. And that's really fantastic for energizing the team and getting them really thinking outside the box and beyond, you know, the current state, which is, you know, current state's never that great, right? We're never really happy with the way things are going. Uh, the ideal state really allows us to step outside and say, well, what if, what if, which is great. Then we come back down to earth and the future state is the question, what can we do in the next six to 12 months? Sometimes it's three to six months. And I usually advise three to six months because that means we can iterate and then we can do it again and we can find some new opportunities because the first time you're doing value stream mapping, you're going to find a ton of things that are super easy to do and you can do them right away. And then there's some more challenging things beyond. So I would say your average future state, you might be looking at six to 12 months, but the first time that you do this, I would say three to six months, you're going to find tons of things that you can do that leverage your current capabilities and make this massive improvement to your value stream. So I mentioned capabilities. Capabilities are a major factor in future state. And it's another thing. It's another mapping exercise. And if you guys are interested in that, uh, I'll, I'll share some resources on that. It's, the value stream map is really one of four maps that I share with organizations. Really only had time to talk about one, my favorite one. But this combination of the four key maps of DevOps really drives you to this like super improved state that's supported by capabilities and eliminating dependencies and defining your outcomes super clearly and mapping the value stream. Um, and so if you're curious about that, get in touch with me. I'll share more information. There's, there's a lot more to talk about. But the future state is really about what are we capable of as a team in the next six to 12 months? which could mean hiring people. It could mean we need to do some training. It could mean that we need to adopt a tool or uh, build some automation, but we need the capabilities to do that, right? So you need to consider capability when you're talking about future state. And that's why it's a little bit more down to earth. It's a little bit more realistic, but that means that it's achievable. That means that we can actually start doing this stuff right away. So to kind of sum this up, and I think we're getting to time, which is, Perfect. Um, before we go, I want to let everybody know I'm going to stick around. You can find me, shoot me questions. I would love to talk to you about any of this stuff and I will answer any question you have. I promise. I love questions. Um, I know I can't cover a ton of material in this spot, but uh, there's a lot to share and I love sharing it. So please do get in touch with me. I'll put my email at the end. There's a final slide with my email. And um, I'm actually writing a book on this. So if you're interested in the book, get in touch with me. It's going to bring you all this and more. Everything about the four key maps that I talk about is going to be in this book that's coming out very soon. What we're talking about when we're talking about flow engineering is this idea of sharing the big picture, seeing it and sharing it, building it and sharing it. This idea that we can all look at the same thing and understand what's going on. And the measurement aspect allows us to make decisions that are not just based on opinion, not just based on our experience, not just based on our gut feeling. We're deciding based on data, which is incredibly powerful, which because it means that we can measure the impact of those decisions. We'll know whether that investment was good or not, whether you know, we achieved what we wanted to achieve. We can set our targets and say, we're looking for 30% improvement. We're looking for 200% improvement. You can't do that unless you're measuring. And by measuring, we gain this ability to invest where it's going to pay off, where it's actually going to have an impact. And the bottom line of all this, how this all comes together is we start with this clarity, right? We start with this picture that everyone can understand we all gain clarity and understanding of our surroundings, right? The landscape. We add flow that allows us to deliver more value, more effectively, more often at higher quality. 
And that makes everyone's lives better, right? It makes it more enjoyable to do the work. It means that we make more progress and our customers benefit from that. And by eliminating the waste, it means that, you know, we're getting to a better spot. You know, we're doing more with less. And that's incredibly powerful because how, how much of us have big aspirations that, that always seem out of reach by eliminating waste and improving flow, we're able to reach those goals. We're able to achieve those things and get to that higher level of performance. And that's it for me. So if you'd love to chat further, uh, meet.visible.is is my calendar. You can book time with me. You can book a conversation. I would love to jump on a Zoom or a, or a phone call with you and talk about any of this stuff. And my email address, steve at visible.is. My website is visible.is. Um, please get in touch. Uh, thank you very much for joining. And, uh, and I hope to hear from you. And I'm going to check the, the chat. And if I see any questions and if I, if I don't get cut off, I will answer anything that I see. But if I miss anything, please reach out. I will answer your questions. I would love to. Thanks very much. It looks like we have a not a question, but a comment about safe. Um, absolutely safe talks about value streams and they do talk about value stream mapping as an important process. I think an interesting thing about safe is that they used to talk about it very little. And now nowadays, I mean, safe 5.0 and all the new stuff about safe in 2020 and beyond, they're moving everything towards value streams and the idea of value stream mapping and value stream management, because it's so powerful, because it's this ability to see everything. And when we talk about safe, we're talking about complexity, right? We're talking about large scale, lots of things going on. So the value stream paradigm, the idea that all this work is flowing through the organization is incredibly powerful for safe because otherwise, how do you think about all this complexity? How do you organize all this work? How do you make sure that everything is coming together? So I think that value streams are incredibly important to safe any large scale implementation of agile DevOps, continuous improvement, innovation, the value stream is what makes it achievable. It's really what's going to make a difference beyond 2020. You guys are going to hear tons of people talking about this. I promise you um, a stat from Gartner that just came out the other day, 70% um, of organizations are going to be using value stream management throughout their entire organization by 2023. So this is coming. It's going to be huge. And hopefully what I shared today is getting you excited and prepared for that change and on the leading edge of it. And I, I'm committed to leveling everyone up that I can. So I'm happy to share any resources, any guidance that I can to get everybody on board this new revolution towards value streams. Uh, with that, thank you very much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Uh, I hope you really got a ton of value from the presentation. Thank you.